Yeah, so it's so, um, right, so you should do that internally. You don't need, like, unless you don't trust, um, unless you don't trust your results, you don't need to report the actual clusters. Yeah. But you need to you need to check off of that match. So I think it, I think it happens. I think I mean in, in the days of that. It's like something so very small. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not really but yeah, it's sometimes it can happen. It might be. It might be. It might be less than one time. Like one time to happen. Oh, okay. Less than one time. So we should do more than just try. Yeah, if you did more than 20, you say you did 200, I think you'd probably see that. So I think I'm going to say that's good. Yeah. I heard it in this one, it's also like a couple of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Thing in the 
know if I'm the best. I would like to get my probably eight to nine points. So if, if no one does better than that, there's something not the notes I've If someone does that, I'll give you a chance. Uh, if no one does that, then I'll then everyone has the best time of the things in the notes. Just so you can see that 
how nice the other algorithms work, that if you change the formulation, it can be a little bit harder, and there's not always an, an obvious answer. Um, the, the actual, the, the best way of solving that is, is actually not in the notes. I didn't really cover it in class. If you do something from the notes that works nearly as well, you'll get like probably almost all the credit. Um, but you know, I want to leave a little bit of space at the top in case someone goes and figures out a better way to solve it. Um, but it was intentionally, that question was intentionally a little bit tricky to make it a little bit more fun. Um, but hopefully, you know, if you run something from class that you're convinced works pretty well, you should, you know, it, it should, you should get a good grade as well. Any major questions on that? Yeah. Sorry, uh, which question you said is? Uh, let's see. Nope, hit the wrong. Uh, let's see, this. The clustering, okay, the, the k median clustering problem. I didn't talk so much about the k-median clustering problem. Uh, just so it's clear, um, this, I can't draw in here, but this distance function is Euclidean distance, but the cost function, right, so the, the cost function here is not the L, normal L2 cost function associated with the k-means, right? So the cost function is different, but the actual distance between two points is still the Euclidean distance. Okay, and changing the cost function makes this so it's not clear what the right way to optimize this cost function instead of the more standard but maybe less intuitive um, cost sub two function where you square the distances on the side of the sum. Okay, so um, you know it should be a little, um, it's meant to be a little tricky, but you can apply techniques and see what works well, and then if you want to kind of try how to really something that will optimize for this and uh, see if you can solve it. You can probably get a, maybe a, to get totally full points uh, once you do that, but you'll probably get like 18 or 17 points if you do something that, that works, works pretty well on here. Okay. Um, and also notice there was some discussion on Canvas. Uh, this had listed the wrong number of points on um, each of, of the data sets. There should be uh, the C, I think I have these right now, C1 had 21 points, C2 had 1,029, C3 still has 1,000. So they're slightly <coughs> off from what, what I initially had said. So that's been, been updated. Okay, great. Um, All right, so we're, we're going to talk a bit more today about streaming algorithms. Um, and so we're, and, and not just streaming, but a little bit of generalization of this model. And the plan is to talk about um, kind of roughly three or four topics, and we'll probably spend most of the time on two of them. We're going to talk about first the um, count min sketch. So th this is a, another way of solving the same um, frequent items problem that we solved last week with the Misha Gries algorithm. Um, so it's the same thing you have with this long, I'll, I'll repeat the streaming kind of model again, but you have a long string of, of these tokens and you want to find the ones that occur most frequently and approximate the how frequently all of those occur. And this is a different way of doing it that has different trade-offs, and this will be based on some hashing techniques. Um, so just to see there are multiple ways to solve this problem, and the trade-offs are different, and when do you use one over the other. Um, so we'll, I'll, I'll kind of describe this. It's another short and cute algorithm. We'll actually include um, so a small actual proof that, that this actually works. So it uses ideas from like these um, from the first lecture that, that um, um, one of the first lectures of content where you use like s these concentration bounds a little bit. So a very simple application of the concentration bounds, um, you can see that, that this works. So we'll go through that just to kind of show evidence of that. Um, I will then probably quickly describe another variant, um, not going in as, as, much, as much detail that's just called the count sketch. Um, 
So it's the same, it just doesn't have the mint part. Just to show an, another variant of this also works. Um, we'll then talk about a, um, probably a little bit more time on a um, frequent um, item set problem. Okay, so instead, we just want to decide whether one IP address occurs in a lot of packets. We want to say things come in, come in sets, right? And I'm looking at, at tweets, and I want to know which words are common, but I also want to know which pairs of words happen to be in the same tweet, um, same tweet colony. Um, not necessarily right next to each other like a k-gram, but just appear in the same tweet, right? Um, or maybe which set of three words appear in the same tweet. How do I determine this instead? Um, and this is, combinatorially, is a much harder problem. Because um, now you have to say not just individual things, but all um, pairs and triples of, of, of possible items. And there's kind of, um, kind of a very well-known algorithm called, um, um, that's called the a priori um, so algorithm that I'll talk about. Um, which in some data mining classes you might, maybe if you especially have taken them 10 years ago, they maybe spend like three lectures on variants of this. I'll spend about a third of a lecture on that. Um, I'll say more, a little bit more about it then. And just to put this in context, I'll mention maybe a little bit about um, 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 so bloom filters. So who's heard of a bloom filter? So a few people asked me about after the frequent after the lecture last time how this relates to bloom filters. It turns out the count min sketch is very similar in some sense to a bloom filter, and so I'll just mention what the bloom filter is just so you can understand it. The bloom filter just determines whether items exist or not. It doesn't count how many distinct items or how many of each item, just whether something exists. Um, and the structurally it looks similar to the count min sketch. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll distinct, I'll just maybe describe it briefly just to distinguish between these things. Okay, so that's the plan for today. Um, okay, and so just to review, um, the streaming model is that our input is going to be this large kind of sequence of these, of these items where we're going to assume that each AI is going to be, in this case, in some bounded universe of size M. Right, so there are M possible things. It could be M IP addresses, M possible words in the dictionary that we're keeping track of, um, something like this. Both M and M, M and N are very large. Um, so M and N are very large. We, we want to use roughly, say, on the order of log N plus log M space. Okay, and so the streaming model is such that you're going to be scanning through this up to some set um, up to, or maybe you're going to be scanning up to some point here. So you're going to um, up to some point in the stream AI, and you have some um, some memory, um, and you only are allowed limited amount of space to store something about A. If you're in a router, you can't store um, you can't store all the packets that go through that pass through you in a day, you can only keep some statistics about them. Yeah? Uh, it doesn't have any order, right? I mean, we could have A1 and then A7 and then... Right, I will, I will think of each AI is going to be a set. Right, it's going to be a set of items is how I'm going to think of the data. But the order is how it appears to me on the router. I first see the first packet, then I see the second packet. Okay, so in, in order to do analysis, I want to do analysis on the data as if it was a set, typically. In some cases, the, the timing of it, you have some time component, and that matters. You want to wait the more recent things more, right? But in this case, I just want to consider the data as a set. The tricky part is that, like an adversary, some, someone trying to launch a, 
a denial of service attack, controls the order I see the data sets. So if I knew, like, if all of the first 20 of them were all the instances of the word Apple, right, and I knew I never saw the word Apple again, then I could say, okay, I want to scan the first 20, count how many times Apple occurs. If 20, I think, is a lot, then I keep track of it. Then I say, okay, there were 20 apples. That's it. I see bear the next three things. I say three is not a lot. I'm not going to keep track of it anymore. Right? If, I, if the order was nice, this would be an easy problem. But I'm going to see them in some scrambled order. And sometimes I'll assume that these come in a random order. But typically, I want to make no assumptions on the order. So it could be some, some tricky ordering that, someone, that they've set up to try and fool the router. Right, so I want to assume a worst case kind of scenario of how this has been ordered. So the, the I is always the, the larger, the, the, the index of the larger element? Or of the most recently seen element. The most recent. Yeah, I see them in this order. Right, first I just see A1, then I, I see A2, and I had seen A1. Then I see A3, and I have already seen A1 and A2. Right? And at any point in time, I want to store in my memory, which is a limited amount of space. Right? Think of, you know, I'm, I'm streaming a movie on, on Netflix. I don't want to store it on my hard drive. I just want to know what happened in the last, in the last scene. Right? But I want to keep a model of what happened in the whole movie. Right? I want to keep some model of, of what the data set looked like without keeping the whole data set. Right, so this is kind of how do I find patterns in the data set in this scenario where the data is really, really big. Right, this is one of the kind of newer problems of when you've heard of like this uh, big data was like this, this buzzword about kind of these new challenges in, in computing. And this is kind of one of the ways that people have formalized these challenges. And that you get this data which is too big to store on your computer. So you can only keep statistics as, as it's kind of passing you by. All right, so think of you're, you're driving from here to, um, to like Reno, right? And you want to keep track of the types of rocks that you've seen, right? And you don't know what patterns of rocks you're going to see. So you're keeping statistics, but you can't, you know, there are too many rocks to put them in your car to keep pictures of all of them, right? So you need to kind of summarize what you've seen and adapt that as you see different characteristics as you go. So basically, like if I'm trying to find, like, oh, this is indigenous to this area, I want to make sure that I cross a certain threshold before I count it. Yeah, right. And you don't want to make up your mind of what are the interesting traits to be keeping track of in the first 10 minutes of a, of a, of a five hour drive. I guess five hours would be quick to Reno, right? What was that, what was that about seven, eight hours? Okay. I guess you could make it in five. I wouldn't formally recommend it. <laughs> uh, so, okay, right, so everyone well, understand the model? This makes sense? Right, and so we were looking at this problem of the frequent items. Um, so we talk about this frequency of fj, and that is going to be look at the set of all the ai in the in the in the in, in a that we've seen so far, right? This could be only the a we've seen so far, or think of it the whole a, um, such that um, a the value of ai is equal to j, and it's the number of these things, right? And we want to have an estimate of this for all values of j, right? And so we, the Misha Gries algorithm allowed us to say um, there was going to be some f j hat, which is always going to be less than f j, but not too much less. f j minus epsilon n, where epsilon is some parameter that we have. Right, so, so we had this with the Misha Gries algorithm. With the count sketch, or the, the, the count min algorithm, the, the count min, we're going to have a slightly different guarantee. We're going to have that fj is always going to be less, 
than fj hat. Um, <coughs> but it's not, um, so it's going to be less than, so this is going to be larger than the true count, but not too much larger. Okay? Um, but we're also going to have that this only, that this will hold with probability um, at least 1 minus delta. So there's some probability that our algorithm will fail. Okay, so it's some probability we're, we're, we're not going to satisfy this guarantee, and our estimate will actually be much larger than FJ. Right? If this does not, so this will always be true, this part, but this one might fail. So with some probability delta, which we'll control based on how much space we use, we, um, we're not going to satisfy this, and sometimes our estimate will be too large. Yeah, so it's kind of, this is an underestimate, this would be an overestimate, not too big of a deal. The other um, thing about this is um, this can also, um, this can also handle, um, uh, so um, um, it, it can also handle subtractions. Okay, so let's say I've been keeping track of data, and um, I, I, um, I, you know, I think one of the data sets I saw before, I'm like, no, that was a mistake. I want to undo it, right? Or what's what's common to do is to call this a turnstile model. So think of your. Um, so so who's heard of what a what a turnstile is? This is kind of an old. Old, uh, an, an older terminology that used to have it like you have them at sports stadiums, right? When you walk in an entrance, you, you walk through this gate that kind of is, it's like a revolving door and it spins around. And one of the reasons for this is you could keep track of how many people went into the stadium, right? So you every time it spun a third, there, you know, one one uh, was it uh, 120 degrees, one person went into the stadium. So you can keep a counter of how many people go in, but then when they go back out again, you can do a subtraction. And so this will essentially work as long as all of the frequencies are still positive. So I can subtract something as long as I had first added it. So someone can walk out of the stadium as long as they first walked in. So I can have additions and subtractions. I can have, um, you know, I'm, I'm keeping track of how many people go into a store or are going out of a store, packets go one way and then I get a reply going back the other way, keeping track of what fraction of your emails you've, you've actually replied to versus not replied to. Um, I know with a few of my colleagues, they have a large um, backlog of emails. You may have encountered them teaching some of your classes. Um, uh, so, okay, so I can handle subtractions, which the Misha Gries algorithm could not handle. Right? I could not deal with subtractions. I would, my guarantees would, would be lost in that case. Okay, so let's see how this works. And one of the reasons to introduce this um, is that it, it kind of is a completely different technique. I'm still just keeping track of, uh, I still have a bunch of counters. Um, but I'm going to keep track of them in a different way. I'm going to have a table. Okay, so the the um, count min sketch. Okay, so I'm going to have this table of these counters. Well, I'm going to have a counter C11, C12, up to C1K. And this will be C21 up to C T1, C22. And, and so forth, C, T, K. So I'm going to have T times K um, counters. And it turns out I will set K now equals to 2 over epsilon. And T is going to be, I think, rough, roughly log of 1 minus delta. So delta is my probability of a failure, and uh, and epsilon is going to be my my error parameter here. Is that minus or over? Uh, it's <coughs> over one over delta. Right. 
Yeah, so um, that means I can set delta very small and it's inside of a log, so it doesn't affect so much, but epsilon will, it's the same proportion epsilon was before, before I needed one over epsilon counters, now two over epsilon times t. And t in general, we'll think of like five or 10. Um, okay, so about five or 10 rows, and then the more columns I have, the more, more accuracy I get. The more rows I get, I'm gonna have a, um, a smaller probability of failure of the algorithm. Okay, so I'm gonna have a bunch of these counters, and, and initially, um, so I'm gonna um, initialize that Cij is equal to zero for all ij. Okay, so I'll initially set all the counters to zero. Um, now what's, what's interesting about this is I'm going to w use a set of t hash functions, h, h2 up to ht, okay? Um, so I have t hash functions, um, and so each hj is going to be, um, is going to go from my input space M, all IP addresses, all words, and is going to map to a space K. Right, and so think of this as a random hash function. So each of the uh, each of the counters or each of the elements one through K is equally likely. Okay, so th this is the basic setup. Um, it turns out a hash function roughly takes so each the space of C, C, I, J is going to take roughly O of log N, and the hash and the space required, the amount of memory of each of the hash functions is going to roughly take O of log M space. Okay, so again, I'm getting things on the order of log N and log M again, right? Which is, which is, which is what I want. There's some details about how to do the hash functions properly, and this is maybe a little bit of a lie, but in practice, that's, that's a reasonable thing to think of. Yeah. So this M and M come from the streaming model? Yeah, it's, it's the number of, the, that's how many bits I need to counter in order to be able to count the stuff in the stream, and in order to kind of store a hash function, it's about log M space, it's a reasonable thing. I'm just having a tough time picturing what M and N would be in like real life. Yeah, so think of M as all possible IP addresses, okay. right? So, and then, you know, in order to store one IP address, it's like 16, um, 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 like 16 digits, is that right? In each digit, you would need, let's say, four bits to describe, right? So four times 16 would be log M. That's how many bits I need to describe an IP address, right? Um, the number of IP addresses is, is roughly two to that number, right? Which is enormous, right? Um, and uh, and you know, think of, or it's a number of possible words, right? All combinations of letters up to some reasonable size. An enormous number of possible words, but I only need to keep track of the ones or worry about the ones that occur a lot. And in that example, n would be the number of IP addresses. M is the number of IP addresses. N is the number of things I see in a day when sitting on the rack. Right, the number of packets I see. Yeah. yeah. Um, K, is that K equals tau over epsilon? Or is that uh, two. Two. Oh, two. Two over epsilon. Yeah. Okay, so um, given a setup like this, without worrying about how you recover your estimate, like, like there's an intuitive way how to run the algorithm. Like, well, what can I keep track of? I have, got, have this table of counters, and I have a set of hash functions, and a hash function takes in one of the elements of the stream, and it maps the number between one and k, right? What would I do over the, um, the algorithm? So I'm gonna have a for loop for ai in, in, sorry, in a. Right, I'm, I'm going to, for each element in the stream, I'm going to somehow need to update my representation. How, how would I use this structure? Yeah? You just have 
just hash it and then you encrypt the counter to the place where it hashes? Uh, good. I have t hashes though. Do I do it? Do I only use one hash function or all of them? I always do all of them. Yeah, so you do all the hash functions, right? And let me write this out. So for j um, equals 1 to t. So this is over all the hash functions. What I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to update. I'll try and write this carefully. Um, j, comma, the hash of j of ai, OK? Um, this is going to, I'm going to equal c, the old value, hash of j of ai plus 1. OK, so what I'm, I'm going to do when something comes in, I'm going to take the, the item ai, and for each hash function, it's going to map to one counter, and I do a plus one. I'm, and I'm going to, so it's going to, each of these is, is going to map to a different one of the counters, and it's going to increment the associated counter. Right, so I just go through each of the hash functions, map it to its counter, and I increment the counter. Okay, and so this is all the algorithm does in order to keep track of the data. Okay, and so if I see the same element, and I've used J over here again, but the same element of my universe, the same IP address twice, it's the hash functions are deterministic once I've chosen them. So they're going to map onto the same counter. So the same counters in each row will get in incremented twice if I see the same IP address twice. If I see it a thousand times, their counters, each of the same counters will get incremented a thousand times for once for each of the times I see that IP address. Okay. So if I see an item, one, one IP address a large number of times, then all of, in each row, there's one counter that corresponds to it, which will be very large because of that IP address. Right, so the, the large items are going to kind of accumulate in certain of the counters, is roughly what's going to happen. Okay, so th this is basically the whole, um, this is the whole algorithm of how to maintain the, the information. And I can do a subtraction the same way. If I came through here and I wanted to subtract and this somehow had a sign that said, instead of subtract this item, I just do a minus one here. And that's, it works the same way. And so the, this goes through. Or if I keep track of two data sets in two different streams, I have two routers that each monitor stuff, I want to combine them together, I just take the two tables, if they have the same hash functions, I take the two tables and I add the counters, like um, element-wise, between the two tables. And it's as if I ran it all on one, on, on one data structure. Right, so this has a lot of nicer properties that I could not do with the Misha Gries algorithm. There's some way to add them together with Misha Gries, but I, I won't, won't go into that. But I could not do subtraction. Yeah? So does the reason that the probability that you will be outside the bound decrease as you increase t is that because of the risk of having collisions in all of the... Yeah, right. So, like, these are going to be random hash functions. So, if I have two really large items, right, it could be that in one of the rows, they both collide on the same hash functions. There are two IP addresses which both occur a lot. They both got mapped to the same counter, right? This would be a problem, but I'm going to have multiple of the rows so the prob probability that they collide on all the rows is going to be small. And I'll, I'll go through this in, in more detail. You'll see. Yeah. Uh, so I'm just trying to get an idea of how this would work live. So would this be like a, a router? Um, basically, once it sees an IP address, then this is the statistic that it keeps track of, and then it deletes that IP address. Yeah, and, and, and then it, it goes into some temporary memory, and it, we, you hash it. It updates these counters, which are in permanent memory, 
And then it sees the next packet, and that replaces the temporary memory. So think of it as like a cache or, 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 or something, right? Or in your, in, your, in your frontal lobe in your own brain where it passes through some, some long-term memory which is just keeping kind of aggregates of what's going on. Okay, so this, it, it's, it's fairly simple to actually implement. Um, I haven't told you how do we recover our estimates yet. Like, how do we recover the estimates? So now I want to do a, a query of, for fj hat. How do, I, how do I do this query? I have an, an, an IP address. I want to know how often did this IP address um, occur. Okay, so, um, uh, um, uh, um, 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 so that's exactly right. I want to look at, I want to take J, the IP address I want to look up, I hash it, I'm going to get a bunch of, you know, on, on a query, I have a query come in, now I'm going to pass the query <coughs> to all of the hash functions. Right, I'm going to look at, at these t different hash functions and I'm going to take the min over all of these. So I'm going to take the minimum and that's my return. That's why it's called the count min sketch. So the answer was, was in, in the name here. So let me just write this out. fj hat is going to be the min over, I'm reusing j here, let's say j prime in t, so all of, I'll check all of my hash functions over the values um, yeah, all over the values c, j prime, h, j prime of my, let's call this fq of a query. Right, so I'm going to pass in a query value. The query needs to be in one of these, one of the IP addresses. I'm going to look up all of the counters that this would have hashed to, and then I'm going to take the minimum of them. Right? Why is the minimum the right thing to do? Because um, you're going to be increasing all of them each time you encounter it, or anything that collides to the same, to the same value. Um, so the one that has the minimum will have the least collision. The least of other things also have to be uh, Yeah, right. So I could have done something like take the average or the median of them. But I know they're all going to be over counts. None of them is going to, I'm all, always going to get exactly however many um, items associated with Q plus whatever else ha had a collision there. So I'm never, so I'm going to get all the things with Q and I, what, plus the collision. So whichever one has the least collisions is the one that has the smallest value. So that'll be my best estimate, is taking the minimum. That's right. Yeah, I, I just, can you repeat that, uh, how, how we can collide in only one, one row? Yeah, so if I take just one row, and I look at this example, let's say in the, <coughs> first, in the first row here, let's say that AI, which was a different, which was IP address 7, right, collided, was put in the second counter, and, 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 eight, um, and IP address 8, which is my query, also hashed, hashed into the second counter. So that means the second counter stores the counts of IP address 7 and IP address 8. Right? Um, and, and maybe also IP address 14 and IP address, you know, you know whatever the other, other numbers are, right? Because it is a random hash function. It's a random hash function. So approximately 1, o, 1 over k fraction of all the hash functions gets mapped to each, each counter. 
Now I only care about the large ones again. So I'm only going to care about if something occurs, say, 10% of all IP addresses are, are this one. Then, then I want that to be true. That, then I want to be able to recover that. And if I have k equals to 200, I should be able to get this within 1% error. So if I want above 10%, if it's, I might say, okay, it's, it's 11%, um, but it's, it's still, still good enough. Uh, so k usually is smaller than m, right? Yeah, so k should be much, much smaller than m. Okay. Yeah, yeah, think of k as almost like 100. 100 will give you, or 200 will give you 1% Because I have 2 times epsilon, if that's 0 0.01, that's 1% error. So 1 over 0.01 is 100 times 2, 200. But still, these are on the order of, you know, m is, you know, billions and trillions, right? So 100 is very small. Yeah. Wait, so then both the error and the probability that you will be within that error are independent of n and m? Yes. Yeah. The, the error, the error bound, if I go here, like it's, it's the percentage of the total count bound. So this oh, error kind of depends on yeah. the total size. So it's, um, it's not complete magic. Um, OK, so let me. Um, explain briefly why this works. And let's quickly go through some analysis. So I, I think hopefully it's clear, um, hopefully it's clear that f of q is always less than f of q hat. So I, I'm only going to get over counts because of collisions. Right? Um, so only over hats. Um, so I, I need to show, I want to say f q is less than, f q hat is less than f q, the true value, plus some w, and I want to kind of put a bound on, on w. I want to say that w is not too large, it's going to be epsilon n with some high probability. Okay? Um, and so the, 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 the key insight is that um so, um, so j just that in, in any row, let's, let's analyze what happens. So, so in, in any row, I only get uh, error if there's a collision with, with one of the counts. And this is roughly 1 over k of, of all the data. So let's, um, so the right way to think about this is some, some random <coughs> variable. So a random variable I'll call y. Ij. So this will be Fj with um, with probability one over k and zero um, otherwise. And so this is the probability that this represents in the um, in the uh, so this is in the jth row. Um, the probability that um, for some counter, the jth counter for the hash function j of some query q, that it is um, um, th that it um, let's see the the over count from um, the element, I've used j here, let me write j prime here. Um, the overcount from element j prime in the set of all IP addresses. Okay. So the, the, this is saying in the i in the Flipped, I flipped I and J here, so that's let's call this I J, and this is saying 
and I've, I've overloaded my variables here. So let's say that okay, so the J okay. okay, so we'll say F of P, so some P element, so P will be in the set M. Right, so in the jth row, that the P IP address, the P IP address, is it's going to give me an, an overcount associated with my query, which is a Qth IP address. Okay, so my query is Q, the probability that another IP address is going to give me overcount, how much overcount will it give me? That's going to be Y of PJ. Right? And so if it collides, I will get all of its frequency as its overcount. If it doesn't collide, I get zero. So with probably one over K, I get its, its, uh, its overcount. And then I can set another random variable, um, X of, X of, uh, X of J. And this will be um, the sum over um, P in all IP addresses of Y, P, J, right? So this is, um, so in, in the Jth row, the total overcount on C of J, H of J of my query. Okay, so um, this is not equal to Q. Okay, so I'm going to add up all of, all of the terms that I could have gotten over count, right? And of all the terms, they each are random variables that, that, <laughs> that look like this. Um, and so I can say that the um, the expected error I get in any one row, the expected error in row J is going to be XJ. Right? And, and the, the, this is equal to the expected error. It's the sum of all of the potential, um, all of the P um, not equal to Q of Y, P, J. Which is the sum of all of, um, of P not equal to Q of F of J divided by K, which which is going to be equal to um, which is less than or equal to n divided by K. Right, and if I set um, K equals to two over epsilon, then this is going to be epsilon n divided by two. Right? I did a less than because the sum of all these counts is at most n. I've excluded, you know, there are some that are assigned to q. I've ignored those in here. Right? The, the ones that are correctly counted, I can ignore those in the error bounds. So it's actually slightly less. Right, did you go from the expected value of the sum of y, p, j to the sum of f of j Right, so this is an expected value. So the expected value of xj, xj is a sum of these random variables, so I can do this. Right, and so th this is, so, so the expected value is the value I get times the probability that I get that value. So it's zero times k minus one over k, and fp times one over k. So this is the expected value of okay, y so, so should that be fp for y, p, j equals f, p divided by k. So this is p not equal to q. OK, so is that supposed to be f, p, not? Yeah, okay. good, good, thank you. Yeah. Right, and I know that the k I can bring out, and the sum of all these is at most n. <coughs> Right, so I get that the expected error in any one of my um, any one of my rows is at most n epsilon n over two. 
Okay, so this is less than the, the bound. I want it to be at most epsilon n. I have a factor 2 to play with. And it turns out I'll use this to combine together with all of the rows. I want to say, if, if I have, what's the probability I have more than twice as much air on all of the rows, that's the only case that I actually do bad. Right, because I can take the min of all of them, the min is going to be the best error. Right, so if, if all of the rows are in, the, they're all independent of each other. Right, so, so at this point I'm going to use the, uh, the um, so I, I can use the Markov inequality, um, which says that for any random variable, the, the probability that um, a random variable is is greater, um, which is always greater than zero, is greater than um, than than alpha, is less than expected value of of x divided by alpha, and I'm going to set alpha equals to the expected value of x times two, then this will be one half. Right, so the expected value of the error is epsilon n over 2. If I, so if I set this equals to epsilon n, right, so the probability that, that my random variable is greater than epsilon n, which is the, my error tolerance, that will be less than 1 half for any of the rows. So that each row, the probability I have more than epsilon n error is at most 1 half. And then because I have t rows which are independent, um, so the, the probability that all t rows have um, more than epsilon n error is 1 over 2 to the power t. Right? So this goes down exponentially now. Right? Every row, you know, if they're all wrong, this is 1 over a half to the power t, and that goes down exponentially with the number of rows. And so if, if I set t equals to um, log 1 over delta, this becomes, um, this becomes delta. And, and, and so that's the whole analysis. Okay, so maybe it was a little bit fast. It's written out in detail in the, in the notes probably in a little bit better, a little bit better handwriting. Um, but it's, you know, the, the, that's the whole analysis. So kind of each row is an independent estimate. Each gives, on average, gives a good bound. So I can combine them together, and I get um, high probability I, I'm going to have a, a good error bound. OK, so you know, if, if, you, if you got this, this is a good example of how this works. If you don't get it, it's not going to be so important for class. You're, what's more important is being able to kind of interpret the difference between these error bounds. What, what can these tell you? If I run the algorithm, I get an answer, fj tilde, um, fj hat. What can I say about what is the true answer? Where does the true answer lie? So you just need to know how to interpret these correctly is ultimately what's going to be important. Okay, um, let me quickly tell you about the count sketch just for five minutes. The count sketch is going to be a slightly more tricky version that has slightly different bounds. Um, it's going to again have this table of these counters, C11, C12, C1. K up to C T K. It's going to look the same way. And I'm also going to have these hash functions, H1, H2, up to HT. And these are still going to be these random hash functions. Yep? Um, why don't we call it C T U K instead of C epsilon K? Uh, <coughs> C. C. Um, yeah, that, that right. C yes, it's C, T of K. Yes, yeah, sorry. Let me just. <coughs> this is C, T1. All right, so I'm going to have T, T rows, T rows and K columns. And, it, and now I'm going to set K equals to 1 over epsilon squared, and T equals 
log, I think, log 2 over delta now. Okay, so these bounds look slightly, slightly worse, but you'll see that they're not really comparable um, once, once I write down the bounds. I'm going to add another set of hash functions, though, which are a special set, um, S1, S2, and ST. So still, H, HJ is going to go from M to K before, and th th this is still random. Um, SJ is going to go from M to a sign. <coughs> so it's either going to be a minus one or plus one, and th this is also at at random. Okay, so I'm going to get hash function before, but I'm adding these extra sign hash functions. So I'm just mapping to minus one plus one. Okay, and so now I'm going to do for a i in a, for j in t. I'm going to do c j hash of j of a i is going to equal c j hash of j a i plus s of j a i times uh, times one, right? So if this is plus one, I add. If it's minus one, I subtract. So I'm either adding or subtracting at random here, instead of always adding. Okay. So now what's going to essentially what happens is the expected value of every counter is going to be zero. The expected value of each counter is now going to be zero because for everything that comes in, 50% chance it's added, 50% chance it's subtracted. So now the expected value is zero. I can now when I go and I look up a query, I go and found the associated counter for each of them, and I know what the associated sign was. So if it's negative, then I expect I take the negative of the counts. And if it's positive, I take the positives. And now I'm gonna I don't I don't have this always overcount guarantee, so I'm gonna take the median of all of the of all of the counters I found. Instead of the minimum, I'm gonna take the median because I don't guarantee it's always an overcount. Okay, so this is gonna have the guarantee that's slightly different. It's gonna guarantee that um, on any query. So the error between any query is at least epsilon times F2, where F2 is going to be the sum over P in M of FP squared square root. Okay, so it's, it's an error term that depends instead of on the total count on this F2 value instead which I defined last week. Um, it turns out, in general, the F2 value is going to be much less than the F1 value. But if you noticed, k up here um, is 1 over epsilon squared. Right? So I, for the same epsilon value, I need a lot more, a, a lot more columns. But I'm, the error is not the total count. It's this F2 value, which in general is much smaller. Um, so it's, it's a little bit incomparable. It's not always an overcount or an undercount. It could be air in either direction as well. Okay, so it's a little bit different trade-off. Um, you know, just to show you that, that there's different ways of doing this. And um, each of these has analogs to kind of more complicated um, sorts of <coughs> statistics you'd want to use. Sometimes you want to extend the count min, sometimes the count sketch, sometimes Misha agrees. <coughs> yeah. Questions? Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, would this mean that since the expected value is zero, would this mean that your counters can be less memory individually as well, since it's not additive then? Yeah. Um, in, in in general, they could they could be less. Yeah. Um, t turns out it, it'd probably save you just a, a few bits. Okay. Yeah, it's it's not going to make a big difference if you still have something that takes. A really big thing that takes 10% of, of all the counters, which would be interesting, then that one is still 
going to dominate whatever count, whichever encounter is in each rows it falls in, and then that's going to be skewed 10%. Right? So you're still, the, the ones that are large are going to tend to be far away from zero. So the large things are still going to show up as being far away from zero. And the small things will end up being noise, and they'll tend to cancel each other out. That's why this, in some ways, works a bit better. Yeah. Well, it's going to say you also have a lot more counters now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, so, okay, so that's that's all I wanted to say about this one. Actually, let's mention the um, let's mention bloom filters now too. Um, a bl bloom <coughs> filter is is kind of a, a whole different goal, and this is um, I, I, I I want to. Um, it, it, it's, it's, it's again, it's going to be a data s structure um, that, th that is, is going to be used for sets, um, for sets. Okay, I'm going to, um, so, 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 so basically you're going to think of on a, on a stream, you're going to say for AI and A, I want to um, put AI um, you know, into S. Right? And I'm just going to throw this in the set, set data structure. And then you know, I'm going to query um, is So on some query, is Q in S? Okay, so, um, and I want to say, if Q is, is, is actually in S, then I want to always, with one L, um, always return true. Now it's 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 not a count anymore. Just true false is it in the set? Um, if Q is not in S, so it's so not in, then I want to usually return false. Okay, so I can have no false positives, but I can have false false negatives. Okay. So, the other way. What? Like the other way? You can have false positives, but not false negatives. Uh, like if you return false, then... Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. right. Yeah, yeah I, can, I, I can never have false, false negatives, uh, but I can have false positives. So I might accidentally say it's in there when it's not in there. Right? But if it is in there, I always say it's in there. Right? So if I want to... Um, Kind of know if there are any. Um, um, uh, um, um, so say, for instance, there's some IP address which is acting acting poorly. I want to put in this blacklist of of, of these IP addresses um, in this Bloom filter, which will have a small space summary again. And and if an IP address comes from one of these blacklisted ones, I want to quickly determine whether it's really a bad actor and. Um, and then maybe I want to check more carefully, is it really, really a bad actor or not? If it's a bad actor, I always want to block it. If it's not a bad actor, um, sometimes I'll still block it. Okay? Um, you know, so th these are the trade-offs I want to do. If I want to solve this exactly, it turns out you need to store at least O of M space. There's, there's no way to, to go around this without having any of these false positives. But if you want to sometimes allow for false positives, then you can really compress the space. And so how the algorithm works is, I want to say for um, AI in A, right? This is a for loop here. Then I'm going to have, um, I'm going to, again, I'm going to have a T hash functions, H1, H2, H2, HK, 
and I'm going to have one um, array of, of bits. Okay, so these bits are going to be, um, what's going to say, I'm going to have of, of, um, of M bits. We'll call this B. Right, so it's, I have one array of bits. Initially, I initialize, I'm going to set um, init B of J equals to zero for all J. Okay, so now as something comes in, I want to say for all, let's, let's say, make, instead of J, let's say make this an S. Okay, for all. Okay, so initially I set all the bits to be zero as um, for j equals one to k. So for all the hash functions, I'm just going to set b of h of j of my input item equals to one. Okay, and, and this is all I do to maintain. Um, on a query, I check all the hash functions for all the bits, if they're all one, I return true. If any of them is zero, I return false. Okay, so the difference here is I, have, I only keep track of bits, so I'm not doing counts. So th this compresses the space. I don't need um, log n bits for each counter anymore. I just need one bit. Um, so this is often used in really kind of where I really need to compress space. And I can overload the bits. Two of my hash functions with the same element could land on the same bit. I'm not keeping separate counters, separate rows. I'm just putting them all into one array of bits. Yeah? So why can't we merge this technique with the counts, and then instead of having it be a bit, have it be a count, and then we can also have the counts? Yeah, so th there's weird things with, with the collisions of the counts, um, and it's a little bit harder to analyze and keep track of. Um, there are some variants of this that do try a bunch of these things, and they have to keep various extra information, and there are some approaches that, that, that do this, but in general, they're much more complicated. Um, so, yeah, th there are some things like this, but generally people use, just for keeping track of the set, whether it exists or not, they'll use a bloom filter, and if and um, and if they're using, um, they want to do counts. They'll do like a count sketch or a count loop sketch. Um, there are ways to something in between, but generally they work better to separate. Okay, so just that's the difference between a bloom filter. They're very similar objects. Um, Since we're keeping all the bits in like the same row this time, rather than having them in separate rows like before with the counts. Um, are we at high risk of getting multiple, like, getting collisions? Because you could get H2 of one value to map to the same bit as, like, H10 of another one? Yeah, you need to figure out how big, how many bits to use, how many hash functions to use, so that this, this works out well. And there's, in the notes, I have some ways to kind of prescribe roughly the right way how to set these. You're dangerous of various of these issues, yeah. Um, in general, if you increase the number of hash functions, would that increase your rate of collisions in this case? Correct, yeah, but you also, if you only use one hash function, it's easier to get um, these false positives as well. Right, so there's a trade-off. The right number of hash functions turns out to be, you want to set k roughly to be m, which is the number of bits, over n, which I think is the number of distinct items um, times log or natural log of, of natural log of two, right? So if you know the number of bits and number of distinct items, then you should use about this many hash as functions. And this is the back of the envelope calculation, um, but there's some. So you can look in the notes and see kind of. It turns out to really understand this is much more complicated. Eventually, you have to just like reset since you're always turning bits on. Well, yeah. So this would be if you knew the number of distinct items ahead of time, then then you could decide if uh, if this was changing. Then there's it's I've seen papers in the last few years that have tried to deal with how do we 
as the as the number of distinct items grows over time, how do we how do we deal with this? This is there's there's some various techniques of having kind of a hierarchy of bloom filters, and you you start ignoring some after after some period of time. And it's yeah, it becomes tricky. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Yeah. Often someone guess you'll try and guess ahead of time. There are only this many distinct words, roughly. So maybe I will kind of pretend there's I'll see twice that many over the over the next year, and that'll and at that point I'll reset my statistics or something like that. You know, I, there are various there are various mechanisms of how to deal with these sort of issues, but these are kind of the overview of the basic tools. Okay, I have one more topic I want to cover today. Um, we're starting regression next week, so um, we'll come back to streaming from matrices, which will make more sense after we talk about dimension out of reduction and some. But um, one more example, which is not really a, um, not entirely a streaming problem. This is the a um, priori algorithm um, for um, the frequent. Um, item set. Okay, um, so instead of items, I'm going to get a set of items each thing, right? So now my my input. Think of the input into the stream, and in this case, we won't always do strictly streaming algorithms, but they'll kind of be multi-pass algorithms. You could think of the, your input as being, say, a stream a1, a2. <coughs> up to a n, but each a i is actually going to be a set of elements, x1, x7, x um, you know, 14, and this will be some subset from some, some universe. So think of each item being a tweet and it has a set of words in it. Right? I, just, I don't care about the ordering of the words, I just care about the set of words, words which are available. And so I want to determine which pairs or triples of words occur frequently all at once. Okay, so the initial motivation of this was um, market um, basket um, analysis. So, um, so, that, so people, want, I, I, I think this at least written down in textbook and stuff, people were analyzing receipts from people at grocery stores. What products did they um, did they buy did they buy together? So if you bought peanut butter, you probably also bought um, you know you probably also also buy bread, right? You'd put peanut butter on bread, so you'd buy those receipts that had one, but also have the other. You'd want to uncover these patterns and maybe new patterns. And there was this there was this um, kind of the example they give of an unexpected pattern would be um, beer and and uh, um, so beer and diapers, and they rationalize this by saying, okay, the, at, yeah. at night the, the <laughs> husband goes out to get diapers that they ran out, and he's like, well, I'll pick up some beer too. <laughs> and, um, and so this appeared in a lot of textbooks, this, this sort of example. Um, I'm not sure whether it, this actually shows up in the data or not, but it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a catchy example. Um, I've read a bunch of grad school applications where people say, I saw this example and this made me want to go to grad school and I usually, <laughs> I usually throw those out. Um, <laughs> so, uh, for, maybe not for the reasons, well, anyway, I won't get into that, but uh, so, um, okay, so anyways, doing this in a stream, finding these pairs of things is hard. Basically what you want to do is, um, Find all um, tuples. Um, so, so tuples that could be up to up to like five things or three things, you know, of x1, x2, x7, um, which um, co-occur in at least epsilon n. Um, of the of the baskets, right? So again, we think we have a data set of size of n 
of n of these distinct sets. Right? I want something that occurs in at least, let's say, 5% of the sets. So if I set um, epsilon equals 0 0.05, then that would be 5% of the sets. So 5% of all the receipts had diapers and, and, um, and beer in them together, then this would be one of the hits. 5% right? might be a little bit high in a grocery store, so you might set it to like 0.5%. Um, like, uh, maybe then you start getting some interesting hits. Um, or maybe something like milk and eggs actually occurs in 5% of all baskets, right? Um, the, the, those are just common things. Okay, so, so we're going to give up on actually doing this in, in, um, in, um, in, in one pass over the data. We're going to make multiple passes. If we're going to find sets of size up to k, we're essentially going to make k passes over the data. Each pass is going to be um, essentially faster and faster. Okay, and so the, the the insight, the key insight into making this work is that if um, if x1, x2, and x7 occur co-occur in five percent of the baskets, right? Let me write this up. If x1, x2, x7 co um, occur in 5%, then each of x1, x2, and x7 must each um, occur in 5%. Right, so I, I, if I want to find a triple of things that occur together in 5% of the baskets, then each of the individual elements must also occur individually in five, at least 5%, probably more. Right, so what I can do is I can first filter, instead of looking at all possible items in the grocery store or all kind of words in, that I see in tweets, I want to um, just keep track of, I'm given, right, the, um, I'm given this on input, right, some fraction of all the things, of all the things I care about, I want to first filter just by the interesting items or the interesting words that occur at least that amount of time on their own. And then after that, I can go and look for the pairs just among those items. And so I'm going to filter a lot each, each of these steps. Um, okay, so let's, um, let me go through an example here, just to kind of show you roughly how this, how this works. Um, I, I want to find find um, tuples in at least one-third of sets, right? So out of 12, they need to occur at least four of the sets, right? So the first thing I do is I keep, and, and here I'm just going to keep counters um, for 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, Nine and uh, yeah, only up to nine. Okay, so I'll keep counters here for each of the individual things. Let's see, zero occurs twice, one occurs three times, two occurs five times, three four times, four three times, five three six, eight seven four. 8, 2, and 9, 4, right? Okay, so of these, the only interesting ones are 9, they need to occur at least 4 times, 7, 6, 3, and 5. Right, so th those are the only interesting ones. I know 0 will never occur in an interesting tuple. It only occurred twice. I need the tuple to occur at least 4 times. Right, so now I can set up an, another thing where I say, let's look at just these sets, two and three. Right, so I'll look at two and three together. I'll look at two and six together, two and seven. Um, we'll look at and two and nine, and we'll look at three and six 
3 and 7, 3 and 9. Okay, there's one out of space. Let's go over, um, over here. Uh, 6 and 7, 6 and 9, and 7 and 9. Okay, so now I have to keep track of, um, what is this, uh, 10? 10 different things, which is the same number I had to keep track of before. Right? I didn't have to, if I had kept track of all pairs initially, that would have been 10 choose 2, right? Which is, uh, was, that's uh, 5 times 9, which is 45, 45 pairs. So I've gone down from 45 pairs down to only 10 pairs I need to keep track of, right? And if I look at these counts, All right, so th these, these counts are going to be 2, 3 occurs once, 2, 6 occurs three times, 1, 2, 3, 6 occurs three times, 3, 7, 0 times, 3, 9, once, 6, 7, three times, 6, 9, four times, and 7, 9, twice. Okay? And now if I want to check if there are any triples, well, I can first see, well, the only interesting pair is, is the 6 and 9 pair. There are no other interesting pairs. If there was going to be an interesting triple, it would have had to involve 6 and 9, and also 6 and a third one, like, um, like 3. 6 and 3 occur 3 times. 9 and 3 would also have to occur 3 times. Right? So if there was a 6, 3, 9, I would have needed this one to be at least four, this one to be at least four, and this one to be at least four, right? But only one of them was, so they can't. So there's only, there's only one, there's no triples I need to count, and I can stop, right? So the, the, if I set the threshold at one third, the only interesting tuples are those individual ones up top, and then this one double six and nine, and I can stop the other. Right, so by doing this filtering, I, I don't have to check all the combinatorially, um, uh, all the combinatorially many, many pairs of these things. Okay, and so you kind of do this over a small number of scans over the data set to figure out what things you need to keep track of. And, and there's like variants of this that applies it different ways. Um, this algorithm of kind of filtering more and more complex things is actually a useful primitive that comes up in other things. If you want to find these little motifs and graphs. Like, if you want to find, um, when we talk about graphs, it'll be interesting to find three vertices in a graph which are all, which all share edges between them. Basically, the most efficient ways to find all of these triangles, um, interesting triangles like this, is to do something like this, where I filter based on, I only look at triangles where I know that, um, like, the, you know, I look at, at edges and then I look at, you know, possible neighbors. So if I want to find sets of four things, I, I make sure that all the triangles exist before I, I find sets of fours. And, and usually when you do this, the bottleneck is often at the second or the third level, not at like the fourth or the fifth level where you get complex expansions. Um, okay, so there could be much more I'll say about this, but I, I'm, I won't. Um, when we'll, um, okay, next week on Monday we'll start the regression section and we'll start by kind of going over like most of uh, a big review of a lot of regression techniques in 2D and then we'll start looking at various things in high dimensions afterwards. Thank <laughs> you.